So uh, today we've got a very special colloquium. It's a two for one. We've got uh, two speakers and we'll switch kind of halfway through uh, and we'll pause uh, at the halfway point to take some questions. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Sam Bardin. So Sam uh, received his doctorate in astronomy from Penn State, uh, where he was one of the pioneers of the first optically coupled uh, bench mounted spectrographs. And he is currently a systems engineer at Mauna Kea Spectroscopic uh, Explorer, which is what he'll be uh, uh, talking about today. And uh, then second up, uh, we have Andy Shinas. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing did, that. Yeah, uh, very good. good. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Andy uh, received his doctorate in astrophysics from the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, and he is now the director of engineering at CFHD. Um, and he'll be speaking second. So, uh, yeah, Sam, take it away. I'll be ready. Okay. I guess I should. And if you want the laser pointer, it's right here. Okay. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time uh, visiting uh, the Institute here, so uh, much appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, um, some variations in the telescope uh, design uh, for the Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Explorer uh, that we're exploring. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Explorer, so I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, but very briefly. Uh, so first off, uh, you know, it's, it's, so it's uh, to produce a dedicated, uh, massively multiplex spectroscopic facility um, dedicated to large scale surveys, uh, both in the optical and the near infrared at sort of a, a lowish spectral resolution and then a moderately high spectral resolution. Um, it's, a, it's a project that's currently led by the Canada France and Light Telescope Corporation uh, and partners and involves a few additional partners. I think Andy will go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, and then we want to stress that uh, what uh, out of respect for uh, the cultural aspects of Mauna Kea, uh, we are trying to do this repurposing of the, of the facility in uh, hopefully as minimalistic as we can by not changing the footprint of, of the observatory and minimizing uh, 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 external uh, structured uh, visual aspects of the, of the facility. Uh, while we're still trying to make a, you know, cutting edge uh, astronomical uh, observatory. So the, the, the current uh, baseline, uh, it's got a one and a half degree square field of view uh, and 4,300 fiber optic probes. So, and it's, it's at a prime focus. So the, the diameter of the, of the telescope is about 11, 12 meter diameter. So we're upscaling uh, from the four meter size of the CFHT. We can do that because the CFHT is old school. It's on an equatorial mount. Equatorial mounts are very massive and, and especially when you're so close to the equator. Uh, so the dome uh, footprint of CFHT is, is actually quite large and you can fit uh, a modern large aperture telescope inside of it. Um, so the, the initial design is prime focus feeding uh, 4,300 fibers, uh, of which uh, 1,000 of them feed off to a bank of high resolution spectrographs uh, located down below the telescope, and 3,200 of them feed uh, a, a bank of low to moderate resolution optical and near IR uh, spectrographs uh, located up uh, a bit closer to the telescope. Um, so here again, it's 11.25 meters. Um, to fit it within, in, in this case, uh, they allowed, uh, the design was allowed to increase the size of the dome by 10%. Um, and even then, you, you had to go with a very fast uh, prime focus, F1.9, uh, which is, is quite fast, even for fibers, uh, a bit so that uh, you can fit within this uh, objective of not changing the footprint by much. So that's the baseline. So why look at different designs? Um, 
Part of it is driven by we have uh, some pressures on us that uh, are giving us time. One of those is, is uh, uh, clearly the, uh, the Mauna Kea uh, lease uh, issue. Uh, you know, it's probably buying us five to six years, seven years before we can seriously start construction of the project. So that's buying us a bit of time to re-examine the design. Um, and the second is uh, we've been, um, the spectrograph designs are very challenging, especially with this F2 uh, collimator and the large size of the, of the optics uh, needed. Um, and so that's been taking some time to, uh, uh, to, to sort out. Um, and then most importantly, uh, upon analysis of that prime focus, uh, we uncovered that there's an optical ghost uh, issue, uh, which is the, the main reason why we're uh, exploring different telescope designs. And this is driven because MSC, we want it to be a premier facility. It's a 12 meter class telescope. We want it to be able to do the faintest objects that we can. Uh, to complement uh, the depths that LSST can, can go to. And so that the uh, science requirement that I'm driving this analysis on is at 24th magnitude at resolution 3000 within one hour, we want a robust signal noise in the continuum at that 24th magnitude of two, preferably higher. Background contamination critically matters. You're, you're in the muck of the sky and you're in the muck of lots of, of, of uh, biases that are working against you. And uh, so when I came across it, there's this optical ghosting that introduces uh, another component of this background that you have to, to worry about. Um, so we looked at uh, a couple different telescope designs. We looked at uh, a revised version of the, of the prime focus. We looked at uh, um, some cast, two mirror cast designs. And then I, I threw in this uh, a three mirror and a stick mat, which is sort of the same family that LSST uh, arises from, but it's, it's got some subtle differences that allows us uh, to get the focus outside of the telescope. Um, and it really was just, you know, a three mirror telescope should be minimal lenses. So it should be minimal um, uh, optical dosing. And I thought that would make a good baseline comparison. I really wasn't expecting it to, to potentially be a, uh, a contender uh, for, for the actual telescope. But anyway, here's the... Tim? Mm -hmm. well, a simple question on the previous slide. What does... Um... If you go back, what is six W eight? Oh, that's just uh, the nomenclature of the of the baseline uh, design. Uh, it's yeah. So here's uh, uh, the the optical ghosting comparison. So we put in a simulated target field, and uh, where it's got some six magnitude stars, and this is that six W six, the, the baseline design. And you can see all sorts of stuff lighting up. Uh, uh, you see uh, some uh, pupil ghosts uh, from, from this bright star. Those pupil ghosts move off the field pretty quickly as the star decenters. So you don't see those pupil ghosts around this bright star, but you see some image ghosts nearby. it. And the, the problem with those nearly in focus image ghosts is you get goes from even fainter stars, lots of them. And so if, if you were to stick with that design, you would have to have a, a, a way of assigning your fiber targets that mitigated uh, to make sure you didn't land fibers on those ghosts by mistake and, and detect spurious uh, signals. Uh, it, you know, something you could do if you've got a small number of ghosts, but we felt that uh, with this, there's just too many uh, for that to really be a viable approach. Um, this is, uh, I didn't change the name here. This is the modified prime focus. So we were able to um, um, get the prime focus concept uh, to reduce the number of ghosts. It's, it's got these, you know, more uh, pupil uh, ghosts uh, rather than image ghosts. Uh, and then here's the QM, and, and the QM, the ghosting, can be considerably reduced. 
Um, this, this color scale shows where we want to be. So at 24th magnitude, we really want that ghost contamination level per square arc second to be below 26 and a half and ideally down around 28th magnitude for it to be absolutely non negligible to the uh, contaminating the signal. Um, so, so the QM actually gives the potentially the best uh, performance, but we can get moderately uh, decent performance with, with the modified design. So I'm gonna talk about this QM design. Uh, the reason I call it, so it's a three mirror anastigmat, but we've got a fourth mirror in there that is a fold mirror, sends the light off to the side. So you've got your primary, and that's the 12 and a half meter primary segmented, uh, feeds to a, a secondary. There's an internal focus uh, produced, uh, and then it goes off to a tertiary mirror, and the tertiary mirror images back a pupil at this location. And, uh, and then that mirror is folded uh, so that you can get the light out to the side. And we were able to balance the design such that this basically can be at a Naismith location at the elevation axis of, of the telescope. So the, one of the big advantages of this is your instrument now is off to the side and in a, a, a less variable gravitational uh, orientation. It's, it's only having to rotate. And so all gravity variations are radial with respect to the, uh, to the instrument. And also then these ADC lenses as well. Um, you don't have axial variations in the gravity that you would with a cast mounted or, or a prime focus mounted instrument. Uh, so that's one of the advantages here. Um, I can move on. So how does it compare size-wise? So this is, again, with that, that enlarged dome. Uh, this is the, uh, the 6W8 uh, concept, uh, the, the, the current baseline with the prime focus. And this is just a uh, uh, recent uh, modeling of the QM concept in that same envelope. And you can see it's, it's a much more compact uh, design. Uh, so again, you have the, your primary mirror here, secondary, the tertiary is down here, and then the quaternary and the ADC, and then your instrument package is here. One of the aspects, because it's a Naismith, you can make this a rotating uh, entity, and you can en enable a, a Naismith port on the opposite side. You could also, you know, since that my battery just died. Since uh, um, since that can rotate, you could also consider mounting smaller ports around the circumference of the telescope as well. Uh, so this opens up the possibility of having multiple mm -hmm. instruments installed on the telescope at the same time. Prime focus and a cast mounted system. Uh, you can maybe do something like that, but you have to have some mechanism again to change things, and it's it's not quite as versatile. Uh, this just shows uh, that the existing CFHT dome. So if for some reason we have pushback and we can't enlarge in our dome at all, uh, it's pretty unlikely that we could fit the prime focus into the CFHT. The, down at the lower left, but uh, the, the quad mirror probably could fit uh, within that, that footprint. So politically, that, that might be an advantage. Uh, and then back here, so basically the advantages that I sort of touched on, you've got uh, your gravitational variation is reduced. Um, you've got the multiple ports, uh, and that allows for uh, possibly uh, having multiple instruments hot on the telescope so you can switch back and forth between them. Uh, so we envision maybe you have an imager on the other port. Maybe you can, because it's also off the telescope, the mass, you could even envision like a Muse-like IFU 
you know, a massive uh, uh, non-fiber fed uh, integral field unit uh, on this on this telescope. Uh, the fiber lengths are shortened. You're, you're no longer having to run the fibers all the way up to the prime focus. Uh, they're just going up to, to the side of the telescope. Um, and uh, and it, we have to slow down the focal ratio. Uh, the models right now are around F4. That increases the plate scale. That allows you a higher density of fibers uh, within that field of view. The one drawback of this is, is the central obstruction is defined by the field of view. So it's not very friendly to larger fields of view because uh, if you make the, this field bigger, that central hole in that fourth mirror has to be bigger and that's uh, more of a light loss. So that's, that's one downside. But uh, I think we're pretty much at the limits of, of the size of the optics that we can implement anyway. And then the sixth item is this mirror is at a pupil, an image of the, of the primary. You could contemplate doing a ground layer AO system. It's a big mirror, three by you know, three meters uh, in one dimension, um, but it's, you know, a future prospect. It's not something that we would propose uh, initially. Um, and then also the fact that the mirrors are doing the majority of your aberration correction. You don't have the chromatic aberration that you do with uh, lens uh, correctors. And so you could also conceivably push a bit further to the blue and a bit further to the red. Um, we did have, uh, so Olivier Lai at, uh, um, did some prelim very preliminary simulations uh, of what could GLAO possibly gain us. And uh, this, <laughs> this is probably difficult to, to, to read, but uh, here, this is uncorrected uh, PSF. Uh, the, the color scale is such that the red is 0.4 arc second size PSFs and the, I guess the green would be around uh, 0.3 uh, arc second PSF. So that's uncorrected. And then you've got where you place your wavefront sensors about mid radius of the, of the field uh, on these three uh, columns and out at the outer edge of these three. And then you've got wavelength uh, going from blue down to, to the red. Um, so you want the blue and black colors. Those are down at the 0 0.2, 0 0.1 arc second PSF level. And it shows that uh, um, so your simulation you did was tilt. The worry we have is because it's a, uh, a mirror that's tilted at 45 degrees. What does that mean in terms of the shear of, of, uh, of a deformable adaptive mirror uh, in your pupil doing. And so you've got a, if you model for, if you had zero tilt, you have 22 and a half degree tilt. And if you have the full 45 degree tilt that the design has. And the encouraging thing is, at least down in the, the red regions, we do see the possibility that, that one could get ground layer that, uh, AO correction. Um, of, of quite a bit, especially if you have your wavefront sensors um, mounted about mid-range in the in the field. Uh, so that's actually pretty exciting, and uh, you would consider that for uh, maybe an imager of some sort. Uh, in terms of fiber density, so this is a comparison to QM versus the prime focus. Uh, the red circles are the patrol areas of the fibers, uh, and and because of, it's just plate scale difference um, uh, from the F4 to, compared to the F2, and and in the background these are uh, D cam images that go down to about 24th magnitude. So every little point of light you see here is potentially within range of observation by MSC. And you could clearly see that you know at the galactic pole, there's you know as JWST has shown, there you know there's targets everywhere, 
Uh, and so, at least for the low resolution mode, uh, you shouldn't have any problem with uh, allocating your higher density of, of fibers uh, onto a valid target. For the high resolution, that might be a bit more of an issue, um, but I my argument is there. You have the fibers you need for calibration for sky subtraction. You know, when when you have fewer fibers, the astronomer is always going to go. I'd rather put the the fiber on a on a target than on sky. And uh, as I said, we're trying to push faint sky is subtraction is everything, and so we want to uh, to be able to. Um, to allocate the fibers that we need for that calibration. So where are we at with, uh, with the study? So we basically have these three concepts that we're going to do a trade study on. So the, uh, the modified prime focus, um, the issue there is it's got the fewer fibers. Um, you know, it's only got 4,300. Uh, we've got this cast design, uh, which, which is actually a quite nice design. Uh, it's very compact. That's probably the most compact design and probably the most efficient uh, uh, instrument package runs on the telescope. And so you're limited in that versatility. But uh, um, I, so it's, I think uh, the, the final selection will come down to either the dual mirror or the quad mirror. And these are just uh, rough order scalings of the fiber count in the field of view. So the QM. At present, gives uh, you know close to twenty thousand uh, fiber targets. So we'll be doing this trade study, uh, looking at you know how do how does the sensitivity really compare between the different designs uh, in terms of fiber coupling performance? Uh, we need to look at these fiber lengths and, and such. Um, there's a, there's a, a bit of an issue about uh, pupil coupling. So the, the spectrograph designs that we have right now have big central obstructions in them. The QM actually has a big central obstruction. So the QM is potentially a good match to those spectrograph designs where the prime focus and the cast systems have smaller central obstruction. So the central obstruction in the spectrograph will throw away additional light. So we need to look at those trade-offs. Um, and then clearly the more mirrors you throw in, the more expensive it is gonna be. Uh, we are starting to look at the, the mass of the QM. Uh, and right now it's coming in under uh, the mass of the prime focus concept, uh, which is which is good. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's much else on there. But anyway, this will this will be taking place over the next one to two years uh, while we sort of wait for other things in the project to to settle in, and. Uh, that, Uh, so we've got a few minutes for questions, so maybe start with the questions. Yeah, yeah um, I had a quick one that when you were showing the three different configurations and the ghost uh, residuals that were left, um, and I think the second configuration, there were these faint arc-like structures. I was wondering what those came from. <laughs> yeah, I, I overran. So, so these structures here. Yeah. So that's um, it's associated with a uh, pupil ghost. Uh, there could be maybe the model didn't quite have the lenses baffled quite properly. Uh, I would I would imagine those you could baffle out uh, and get rid of. Any other question questions? With the last thing you mentioned about like the mass of the system, why does that matter? Why well, so? If you were building a brand new facility, it probably doesn't matter that much. You, you, clearly, you need to engineer the structure to be able to support. We're bound 
by we can't add anything new to the sender interface uh, in a significant way. And maybe we can strengthen the, peer, the existing peer a bit, but it's got a mass limit. And so we need to make sure that we're uh, still within the, the existing mass limit. And so far, it seems like we are. Yeah, you said the design was achromatic, but what about the lenses that's the core? Uh, those, uh, they clearly introduce a little bit of, uh, but it all corrects out. Uh, uh, it, it gives uh, quite excellent image quality across the entire optical through uh, even the K-band uh, region. Okay, so I have a question about the, the dome. So you said that the QF design, uh, you could potentially keep the same uh, dome at least the same size, yeah. but um, what about the shutter? Would you... you need a new dome, yeah. Okay, so yeah. you have to still replace the dome. Yeah, keep the yeah. Same size. yeah, I can't remember exactly how I phrased it, but yeah, I meant to say, okay. it's okay. The, the, the volume of the dome, you could keep okay, the yeah. same. Okay. But, uh, yeah, was... yeah. Uh, Mike, could you have uh, Ben? Yeah. The, these numbers, these are magnitudes per square second of ghosts or the maximum I'm confused about what these. Yeah, are. they're magnitudes per square arc second. Uh, we're using one arc second fibers, so to first order, uh, it's you know. This is the maximum level of ghosting, or this is the statistical average across the sky. So when you go into the galactic plane, these numbers will be substantially higher, or. Well, this is um, so. For example, if you look over here, so so this is clearly that ghost is blue. So that falls within that. So that's around 27 magnitude per square arc second uh, within that ghost structure. That's a ghost from a particular brightness of star. Yeah. So then obviously then the ghost of like a first magnitude star, you just scale straight up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And clearly, yeah, there are there's a threshold where if 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 you if you've got a first magnitude star in your field. You need to avoid those ghosts, uh, but but that's relatively straightforward in this type of design. Where with this type of design, it's, or performance is not. But um, at some stage, following on from that, at some stage in the analysis, um, do you guys anticipate, you know, asking for a given design, what fraction of the sky would have, you know, what fraction of fields contaminated by it? X percentage of the ghosts, but you have some star model of the sky and you can figure out how much loss you had for a particular. Yeah, area. yeah, we've we've done some of that, and uh, um, but you know, the thing here, this is a sixth magnitude star producing a twenty seventh magnitude ghost. So, uh, you know, so if you want to stay, if you want to keep your ghost at that level, it means if you've got a fourth man, anything brighter than a sixth magnitude star. You have your concern. It's not that many six magnitude stars in the sky. Uh, so, but here, I think, if I remember, I think stars down to 13th magnitude can produce ghosts uh, that are worrisome. It's a lot of 13th magnitude stars in the sky. And so, I, I, yeah, we, we haven't done the formal calculation of, of what fraction is impacted. But the other thing is if, if you try to mitigate your issue by modeling this, you need to know, basically you need to really do ray tracing to know exactly where the ghosts are. Otherwise you have to put buffers around it because the ADC is gonna move them around slightly and, and uh, there's, there's all sorts of secondary effects that could make it where you don't quite know where that ghost really is. All right. Uh, yeah, we should probably move on to give any time for his talk. So uh, let's thank Sam again. Okay. Let's see if we can share the screen.
Ah, okay. Um, so the second half of the talk, uh, Sam has told you one of the efforts that uh, we are undertaking with uh, some of the additional time that the project has been granted uh, due to external influences, uh, which is probably a topic for an entirely separate conversation. I'm going to talk to you about the other thing that we are working on, which is essentially uh, to um, develop a Pathfinder instrument for CFHT. So this is very much part of MSC. And really what it is, is an opportunity to develop some of the technology, some of the science uh, early on and um, start using that on CFHT prior to, uh, prior to MSC coming online. So the idea is that we'll fast track uh, some of the technology development and retire some of the risks. Um, we, want, we hope to provide the actual first slide instruments. So really the theme that we started on for the Pathfinder was let's just build two of the spectrographs now and put them on CFHT with a positioner and start learning how to do wide field spectroscopic surveys. Um, in addition to that, the idea is to uh, build up our science team and develop a, uh, a community science product. Um, and you know, essentially what this is, it's a weave or foremost uh, like capability with Moon's capability uh, on CFHT. And it is uh, the only, it will be, we believe, the only wide field spectroscopic survey capability that would be available to, you know, uh, anybody at a R random R1 university in the Northern Hemisphere. If you're not part of PFS, you're not part of DESI, you don't have the option. Um, and uh, I'll also talk a little bit about how uh, we will combine this with an existing project we have going on uh, to be an excellent follow-up tool to LSST. Um, and I will state that we are developing a call for partnership that's going to be released early in 2023 to build up our scientific and technical uh, partnering community. Uh, so just a little bit uh, about MSC itself. It's an international consortium with uh, partners in you know, Australia, Canada, France, Hawaii, uh, India, China, uh, South Korea, uh, individual Texas A&M University, uh, as well as uh, Noir Labs. Uh, the development work that has gone on so far uh, amounts to about 15 million US dollars. And you can't read it, but these are the individual partners and how much they've uh, put in. That $15 million developed uh, the concept design that Sam showed you. Um, and so moving forward, um, we will be spending more money to develop more aspects of it. So that concept design, hopefully it comes through, maybe it's not coming through quite so great uh, over Zoom, uh, but this is a fly-through movie of the concept design. And the point of this is it's not an animation, but this is an actual rendering of a detailed mechanical design of the building, the structure, the telescope, uh, you know, down to the plumbing that's in the building. Uh, and so, you know, it is a, you know, a real design. We're moving on from that, as Sam mentioned. Um, but the point is, uh, we've done a tremendous amount of work so far on the concept design. And much of those work packages will carry over directly to the new design. So in other words, uh, you know, some fraction of the project is frozen at the concept level, awaiting uh, the results of the trade study that Sam mentioned. So scientifically, you know, we have all of these fantastic uh, space and ground-based facilities coming online. I won't list them. The point is, these are discovery tools. And really, uh, what is required is detailed spectroscopic data on each of these things that are discovered to understand them or identify them. There's currently no dedicated spectroscopic facility on a 10 meter class telescope that follows up these surveys. This is the primary science argument for MSE. Um, 
We have a slightly different argument for the pathfinder, just graphically though, showing you uh, three or four different categories, surveys that have been completed. You can't read this, but it's, it's boss and big boss. Current facilities uh, showing you uh, you know, Lamos and uh, Hermes, et cetera. Uh, and what you're looking at is their speed relative to uh, the slow and usual sky surface. So the length of the blue line is essentially how much faster than Sloan the individual uh, the individual facilities are. I'll just point out that this is Sam's new design for MSE, uh, and then this is um, Spectel or WST, which is the ESO version of the project. Um, you're interested in the science for MSC, just download the science case. It's a 300 page science case with over 100 active contributors. We're in the process of uh, analyzing and reviewing that science case based on the new telescope designs. Uh, and in, in addition to that, we are developing uh, the uh, subset of that science case, which is how much of this can you start with a four meter class telescope. And that's really the goal for the science working group that we're forming for the Pathfinder. Um, I will just point out, you know, we have eight different uh, large uh, science uh, groups of the 400 uh, contributing scientists. Uh, and, uh, you know, you recognize Dan Huber, uh, many uh, people you recognize leading those individual groups. I won't go through the details. Um, and just, you know, each one of these could be a talk in itself. Uh, some of the science capabilities for MSE, you know, I think we, we understand. I mean, this is a table of the elements showing the origin of the elements. The red is our process formed in our process. We understand how most of the elements are formed. We don't understand where. Maybe detailed spectroscopy of the relics of uh, early universe star formation in the form of white dwarfs uh, to understand uh, where these elements are formed. Uh, exoplanet composition based on uh, contamination of their atmospheres by, uh, by um, protoplanetary segments. Um, there's only a few of them. Many, many more will be discovered and analyzed by MSE. Uh, this is extragalactic surveys. The blue that you can't, or rather the green that you can't read uh, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, just showing redshift and number uh, is the MSE. Now, there will be tens of thousands of Quasars discovered by LSST. Each one of them is a new line of sight for quasar absorption studies. Um, I don't really understand how MSE will uh, un will add to non-Gaussianity and neutrino mass, but uh, maybe this is uh, something Eric can explain to me later. Um, and the other thing that I just will point out a little bit is uh, transient follow-up capability. And one of the things that we are targeting with the Pathfinder is its ability to be a transient follow-up uh, tool for LSST. Um, and I would just point out that, um, you know, we have access uh, at the CFHT site to 74% of the LSST footprint and, you know, more than half of it at an air mass, it's less than 1.4. So from in a statistical sense, it's well-placed um, to be a follow-up tool for LSST. Uh, these are the initial science requirements for MSE itself. Uh, a low resolution spectroscopy mode uh, in the visible, uh, a moderate resolution spectroscopy mode in the visible and infrared, and then high resolution spectroscopy for galactic archeology, span et cetera, which are small segments of wavelength space uh, three individual segments that have been optimized for particular um, particular lines, giving us uh, abundances that we need um, in, in in three different segments across the visible. And so the idea behind the Pathfinder is we want to duplicate as much of this capability as possible uh, on a four meter telescope uh, using the same technology that we'll use 
uh, for MSE itself. Um, so the Pathfinder uh, is also in response to the Decadal Review Report. And so uh, I'm sure you all read it, memorized everything about it, in particular, uh, talking about the medium and large scale programs. And they talk about creating three tracks uh, for proposals for mid-scale. MSC is a mid-scale, mid-scale is hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and uh, they identify uh, three different science goals for mid-track, uh, for, for mid-scale projects. Uh, track one is the existing call, general open call. Track two is for uh, an MSE life instrument at the $100 million plus level. And track three specifically calls for upgrades to existing facilities uh, and adding community access. So the Pathfinder instrument is in direct response to this call out um, in the Astro 2020 report. Those three science cases are first and foremost time domain astrophysics, and then tied for second, uh, we're highly multiplex spectroscopy, so spectroscopy of stars on an industrial scale, if you will, and radio instrumentation, which we have obviously uh, nothing to do with. Um, so here's the motivation in one chart. Uh, and one, it looks like we can actually read. Uh, so um, red are essentially retired surveys. Um, Green are existing surveys. Uh, orange is surveys that are coming online. And then blue is the pathfinder. So these are between two and eight meter class. Uh, the important point here is the column on the right, which is if I'm a researcher sitting at a random university uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, which of these do I have access to? If I'm not part of PFS, and um, I'm not part of DESI, I do not have access to any of these. And so it is to provide this capability to the U, to the, not just the US, the North American community. It's also to provide it to the Asian and the European community. But if you're a European researcher, of course, you, know, you have access to moons, you have access to weave possibly, et cetera, but not, not here in the Northern hemisphere. Um, Let's see. The most glaring is a lack of spectral resolution of R20,000 multi object spectrographs. Um, and that, I think, is taken actually out of the Astro 2020 report. Um, so here's what the Pathfinder is in one chart. Um, here is CFHT, our venerable 3.67 meter uh, telescope. And the idea, as I said, is to build uh, two of the, well, two or three of the spectrographs uh, that will go on MSE and build them in advance. So, you know, you can imagine uh, the visible and low medium resolution existing in the dome uh, and then uh, near infrared uh, down in the, uh, uh, the peer lab where currently where Spiru and Espinons are, uh, just a uh, you know, an individual uh, set of images of what the ray trace looks like for those spectrographs, uh, combined with a new corrector uh, modeled after the existing corrector for, uh, for Megacam. So it's 80 arc minute diameter wide field corrector, and then the AAO style tilting spine, Kidna style tilting spine with between sort of 1,000 and 1,300 fibers, one arc second on the sky. Uh, allowing you to, to, to probe um, that entire uh, 1.5 square degree field of view uh, in all modes that we would be offering. So, you know, if, if, if uh, we offer both the visible and near infrared at low resolution, low and medium resolution, and if we offer high resolution, in any point in the sky would be accessible um, by uh, any of these capabilities, if that makes sense. Um, so 
That's the prime focus feed. There's also a cassegrain feed. I won't go into too much detail about vision, but the idea is we're combining, uh, co-mounting our existing uh, high resolution, uh, visible spectral polarimeter, and rather this is the visible spectral polarimeter and the infrared spectral polarimeter, uh, and uh, combining that with a feed uh, at bent cast to uh, a coherent fiber bundle that would provide uh, integral field spectroscopy. And so the idea is, you know, we have a prime focus instrument or possibly two prime focus instruments uh, towards the end of CFHT's life prior to closing the doors to build MSE. Uh, and then we have a Cassegrain instrument. And that Cassegrain instrument is really all three of these. It's the uh, visible and near infrared high resolution spectral polarimeters and this uh, moderate field um, integral field unit. Uh, and so, you know, between half and three quarters of the time uh, that the dome is open, you would either be able to access via this folding mechanism, the uh, integral field unit or directly observe uh, with the prime focus uh, wide field corrector. Um, and the idea is that that sets us up for targets of opportunity at least half of the time uh, on CFHT. So namely follow-ups for LSST or as a wiki transient factory. So the baseline specifications of visible medium resolution spectroscopy, RF6000 over the visible band, medium resolution spectroscopy in the near infrared. So that's J and H band. Um, and then uh, high resolution spectroscopy of 20,000 or greater. So this represents sort of three different batteries or flavors of spectrographs. Uh, and it's gonna be up to our uh, science partnership to decide um, how much of this we actually build. Essentially, you're looking at science as a function of dollars. How much science can you afford? Um, but, uh, the, you know, the baseline idea is duplicating all three of these capabilities because that is what is going into MSE, and this is very much part of MSE. Um, I think the rest of this I already mentioned, so I'll move on. Uh, just a quick, i show you, it's always good to show movies. I don't know if this will work over Zoom. This is the tilting spine. So there's a fiber in each one of these little spines, um, and they move uh, to acquire objects. Uh, the patrol radius of each of those spines is greater than the pitch, which means at any point in the field. Uh, so this is each one of these is the center position of uh, the spine um, in the field, and the circles are the patrol radius. So you pick a random point in the field, and the sort of light pink represents access by three spines. Uh, the dark red represents access by five. So between three and five fibers can access any point in the field. This allows for better efficiency uh, in targeting, uh, allows you to reach completeness in your survey more quickly. It also means you can put a little bundle of spines around uh, seven, seven spines on an object on the core of a galaxy, and then you know, in the spiral arms or whatever. Um, I think Sam talked about this a little bit. Uh, we want to duplicate the wavelength splitting technology. So you, you have a white fiber coming in and you split off to the individual colors, which allows you to build these modular, smaller spectrographs. Sam talked a lot about pupil slicing, so I won't talk about that. So I'm in the middle of designing the feasibility designs for the spectrographs. Um, and this is just the blue. Uh, and essentially the visible are based on the unobscured DESI design, which is highly efficient. Um, and for the moment, uh, we're assuming the CMOS detectors because the read noise is incredibly low. Dark current is not, we're hoping they sort that problem out. Uh, but just demonstrating that given the physical constraints uh, in grading size, which we can purchase now that our primary grading manufacturer in astronomy is no longer making gradings for astronomy, that's cozy. Um, so within the real world constraints, 
we can actually build um, a spectrograph that reaches the crosstalk and accommodates the field uh, requirements that we need. Um, and so we're busy working on a visible version of that and a near infrared version that's near infrared version is based on a spectrograph that was built for the Southern African Large Telescope, which is actually designed by Harlan Epps. Um, and that also is showing uh, reasonably good promise. And the high resolution spectrographs are being developed by Kai Zhang at NAOT, Nanjing Astronomical Optics and Technology or something like that uh, in China. And uh, they are also uh, these monolithic spectrographs that uh, require you to, um, to wavelength split in advance. And so the idea is we would build perhaps one of each of these uh, and provide that to the community uh, on CFHT. Uh, the primary science goals, as we mentioned, uh, time domain astrophysics uh, between the IFU and the wide field spectroscopic uh, survey capability at prime focus, uh, about half of the time we would be available for targets of opportunity uh, for objects uh, discovered by Rubin or uh, Zwicky and kind of the ideas that we're discussing is reserving sort of 10% of the fibers uh, for every single pointing of the survey uh, that would be allocated to objects of opportunity. Um, you know, galactic archaeology for the higher resolution mode, uh, generalized spectroscopy of stars for stellar abundance and stellar evolution on a massive scale. Uh, and the, the things that we want to solve well, among other things, on the technical challenges, you know, the idea of the software that's required to make this kind of observation work. You have to interleave PI programs with, uh, you know, large surveys with targets of opportunity. You have to do that in such a way that, you know, you reach completeness with the, with the large programs and you don't shortchange the PI programs and you still, you know, look at the most important targets of opportunity. Um, understanding sky subtraction techniques, as Sam said, we're trying to get down well below the sky limit. Uh, big challenge, especially for fibers, uh, and especially for the situation with the tilting spines, uh, because, you know, we are um, tilting the beam coming into the fiber, which widens the beam on the output of the fiber. And then lastly, non-trivially, understanding the data management and analysis it's going to be a huge amount of data when we're taking, you know, thousands of spectra every hour. Um, and then just a straw man schedule of the way the Pathfinder is going to work. Call for partnership. It's going to come out. Uh, hopefully we're busy working hard on this right now. It's going to come out uh, early in 2023. Um, and then uh, with response from the community, uh, we'll proceed to, uh, to concept design, as well as formalizing the agreements with the community in the course of the following year, formal IFUs, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> going to detailed design phase, 26, 27, construction, and then, and you know, this is a realistic schedule. It's not aggressive, it's realistic, uh, but it's three years of minimum observation with the Pathfinder. Now, it's possible we will get on sky earlier, um, which would allow us to do more science. But the important point is that no matter what happens, we want to be able to, to complete the minimum science data product uh, that we would be offering uh, with this partnership. And with that, I will end with my acknowledgement uh, for the honor to be doing observations on Mauna Kea um, and uh, just acknowledging the location and the cultural importance as well as our partners. Thank you. All right, so let's take questions. So starting with the grad students again. Um, so you talked about having an IFU or an FMOS system like on the group. Uh, I'm just a little confused because I think, if I'm right, on so the FMO system is the prime focus telescope, but 
I think in Sam's presentation, he was talking about a nascent design would be a better option. So I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of curious how exactly are you going to, how, or how do you plan to set up the multi objects across, across the view here if it was a nascent design? So I'm sorry, you're, 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 you're asking about the Pathfinder or about? Um, the Pathfinder, sure. Pathfinder. Oh, about the Pathfinder. Um, so uh, the Pathfinder is a different project. I mean, and it will have, um, whenever we are, so the Pathfinder is another instrument for CFHT. It's just like the existing instruments. It will be on the telescope part of the time, but not all of the time. So whenever uh, the Pathfinder is on prime focus, you know, we have access either through call for proposals or an existing long, large proposal. Um, and then the uh, integral field unit is primarily for targets of opportunity. Um, so it would be there to interrupt time that's been allocated to Espinance or Spiru. That is to say that you couldn't propose to use it exclusively for something else, uh, but uh, you know the idea in terms of targets of opportunity is that you know, sort of half of the time we have a cast screen instrument on, half of the time we have a prime focus. So most of the time you have access uh, through one of those two paths to the spectroscopic data you would get on a target of opportunity. I'm not sure if that answered your yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, any other grad student? Oh. Yeah, this Anybody is else? Karen and Jim. So I had a question with the MSC positioner for the spines. Will you be able to track moving objects? As all the science cases have left out solar system, and that's going to be a major area of discovery for LSST. That is an excellent question, Karen. So those. The current technology um, requires that those spines be, a pitch, uh, be positioned in closed loop. Um, they, they are capable of doing a, a few steps open loop without losing their positioning. So um, it depends on how long you need to integrate for. So typically the way that they work is, you know, when you're not integrating, you back illuminate them, you look at them with a camera, and you position them. Um, so in order to do that for a non-sidereal uh, object, you have to stop integrating and then reposition, you know, whatever, some fraction of the spines. But they are capable of small motions independently, where the small motions are just a couple of steps. The, the uh, error grows as the number of steps. And so I realize that doesn't quite answer your question. Um, it's dependent on, on either how well that technology improves for open loop positioning or whether you're willing to stop an observation and reposition the, uh, reposition the spines in closed loop at that moment. I think it would be really desirable if the technology would advance so that you could track a moving object for a limited time with the spines in open loop. Well, it depends on how fast they're moving relative to the field. All right, maybe, uh, you have a question, Morgan? Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have a conceptual design for the integral field unit, or is it just? Is no, we don't. Okay. It's it is it is not a conceptual design. It's really just a concept, and it, at, so we're in the middle of you know discussing different details. You know, do we feed this with lens slits uh, in order to increase the packing fraction? Probably yes. You know, what F number do we feed it at? And resolution too. But what well, I mean, they will feed the existing spectrographs. So we know okay, so we know right. what will happen on the on the data end. Right. And on the data end, um, they will be accessible uh, not with the high resolution mode, just with the visible and near infrared uh, spectrographs. So R of six thousand between <clears throat> no plans for high resolution. No plans for high resolution for the IFU, but you know that may change. It's all dependent <laughs> on what the Pathfinder science team uh, comes up with in terms of the primary science we want to do. Uh, did you know how to have a, a machine uh, uh, integral field unit? 
a device that can do like high resolution. So that's maybe a technology to consider to use that one too. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we can talk about that sure. afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we're a little bit over, so uh, yeah, let's wrap it up and thank uh, Angie.